Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Grant and this is CNM Glass. Today we're focusing on class 2030 for sections 257 which focus on respiratory coding with sections 30000 through 32999 and 259 which looks at our gastrointestinal section for 40490 through 49999. Our key points today we're going to talk a little bit on respiratory coding some details with moderate sedation and when to code from the HICPICS or medicine sections, as well as some details on testing and diagnostic procedures. And then looking at our GI and hepato, hepatobiliary system, uh, which includes also details on those diagnostic procedures and how to identify the difference between a GI for the mouth and a skin for the mouth when you're talking about procedures done to the mouth. To get us started, I've put some diagrams here on the board. It's maybe not my best work, but you can look in your CPT manual, which I have in front of me as the CPT 2018 Professional Edition recommended for this class, although you may have a different edition. In the CPT manual on page 178, I can find a much better view of our respiratory guy here down at the bottom to show us exactly how the respiratory system is organized, which starts at the nasal cavity and ends all the way down in the bottom of the right and lower, uh, right and left of the lungs. You'll notice that unlike PCS medicine, the lungs are identified as one section from right or left not based off of the lobe. However, there may be some procedures that will identify specifics in lobes within the respiratory section. You'll also notice that the sinuses are going to be included in your respiratory system. And one of the pictures I did not include on the board, which is an, a view of our sinus, ca sinus cavities within the skull. These are some great anatomical drawings that you can find in this edition of the CPT manual, but may not be in your edition. If yours doesn't include these, that's quite all right, but make sure you have an anatomical reference when you're coding within the respiratory or GI sections or any section within the CPT manual. To get us started, we look at section 25.7 in our textbook and we see that there's a guideline here telling us to make sure to look at the respiratory section uh, in section guidelines for CPT manual. There's no specific guidelines for all of the respiratory, so the first thing we should do is look at endoscopy, which I find on page 181, right before code 31231, giving us some guidelines on some of the endoscopic procedures uh, that we code within the respiratory system. Here it tells me information regarding sinus cavities. If I'm looking at uh, specific codes for dilation, if I have the assistance of a stereotactic assisted navigation, there's a separate code I can include from the nervous system. This may not be something you would think about. And so it's important to reference these in section guidelines because they'll give you additional details as to what you may also code. There's additional information for coding unilateral procedures and for diagnostic evaluations and when to code a modifier 52 or 53 if a exam is not, if the procedure is not completed to the full detail of the code description itself. Make sure you're familiar with those and if you have questions as you're looking at them, make sure to ask. These kind of in-section guidelines are exactly what you'll be looking at when you're looking at test exams and trying to take a certification test because oftentimes the AAPC or HEMA will want to make sure that you understand these guidelines and can apply them to the coding that you're selecting. Outside of that, in your workbook, you'll notice that there's information regarding mo moderate sedation. Moderate sedation may be done in addition to the CPT code, and if you're looking at any of the coding manuals after 2017, moderate sedation is not included in your respiratory coding. For any of you who may be looking at older manuals or who may have an opportunity to code for older dates of service, you'll want to make sure that you, you change your date of service in 3M and that you also look at the correct coding book as moderate sedation did used to be included in some of our respiratory codes. Now, however, we're going to look at codes 99151 through 99157. And it's important to identify that this is in the medicine section, not in the respiratory section, and it's something that's done at the same time as your respiratory procedures. This may be when patients need some moderate sedation, either due to a younger age where they can't sit still for the procedure itself or for other reasons that they need to be sedated.
So I'm turning in my book now to Moderate Sedation. And that's 99151 through 99157. For some reason, I always take forever to get through this. All right, so 99151 is found on page 698. There's also in-section guidelines for moderate or conscious sedation starting on the previous page, and there's about a page and a half. It's important that you read through these and understand the differences. It's going to give you details as to when to apply the moderate sedation based off of time and age, and so it even has a diagram with a graph giving you some of that detail. It talks a little bit about when uh, what's included in moderate sedation and when additional agents are included, as well as post-service work or additional service that's done as part of this code and should not be considered separate times. The difference is you have two different code sets with moderate sedation. Your first code set starts with 99151, and this is used for moderate sedation services provided by the same physician or other qualified healthcare professional performing the diagnostic or therapeutic service that the sedation supports, requiring the presence of an independent trained observer. So you have independent trained observer. And on code 99151, this is for patients age five years or yet, five years. Uh, younger than five years, sorry. So under five years old for the first 15 minutes. When you look at the difference between 99151 and 99152, your difference is going to only be in age, meaning that the patient is age five or greater. So we can put a little semicolon here because we want to remember that this is independently trained observer and for greater than or equal to five years old, first 15 minutes. That's still the same. 99153 is an add-on code and would not be separately reported. Uh, so you would only add that for the additional 15 minutes with either 99151 or 99152. Your difference now is 99155 you have moderate sedation services provided by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional other than the physician or other qualified healthcare professional performing the diagnostic or therapeutic service. So this is now an other professional. And instead of observing, they are performing. Okay, just like before, you have for less than five years old and the first 15 minutes. And just like before, codes 99156 is for greater than five years old for the first 15 minutes. And code 99157 is your add-on for each additional 15 minutes. It's easy to get lost in these, and for this reason, I like to look at the chart that's on the previous page because it breaks it down in a lot better detail for you, including the exact time of the interest service for moderate sedation and the patient's age and which codes you would use. Some people will find this easier when adding these codes. It's also important to note that you don't need to add a modifier 51 for moderate sedation. Since moderate sedation itself is not technically a sur surgery, but is done in addition to the surgery, this is not necessary to be added as a modifier 51. Additional coding you'll find in the medical section for respiratory testing is found under the pulmonary section, pulmonary diagnostic testing and therapies on 657, and, or the section for starting with code 94010. You'll notice that this is a fairly small area of the medicine section and includes mostly things like spirometries, measurements of spiromatic metric forced forces, um, bronchial dilation, breathing capacity measurements. A lot of these you'll notice are also vital signs that can be taken as part of the patient's intake by the nurse. And so some of these may not be separately reportable. 
However, procedures such as a nebulizer treatment would. And in cases where you have a medication that's given to a patient and you're using a spirometry or other bronchial dilator, you'll also want to include the medication that's listed. So always code those HCPCS codes to identify if, say, an albuterol is used or some other type of medication. Those are going to be found in your J codes and should always be added any time that something is administered to the patient for the respiratory system. Moving on to our GI system, we're going to look at the GI and hepatobiliary system on its brief overview from 25.9. 25.9 starts on page in your textbook. 759 and starts talking about endoscopic procedures. One of the biggest things to remember with the GI is that we start from mouth to anus. And so when we look at GI procedures, a lot of times when we do endoscopic procedures, if we convert an endoscopic procedure that's done for diagnostic purposes, just like within the respiratory system, that conversion, once, once it's been determined to do an actual procedure, is the only thing that we're coding is the procedure, not the diagnostic service. It's important that if there is a separate session, we can code it with a modifier 59 or one of the X modifiers identifying separate services in the HCPCS manual. However, be aware that not all insurances will accept that even if it was done in a separate section. As coders, you should always code the most accurate procedure despite what's allowed by insurance. And so I want to encourage you to always code everything that's done so long as it's correctly coded. Meaning that if it's a separate section, a separate encounter for the same type of, of uh, approach, such as an endoscopic procedure, you want to identify if you can, in fact, code that separately, even if it may or may not be paid. For purposes in business, we can write those off, and that oftentimes goes towards tax breaks and other details that our business office may be looking at and needing to allow them for uh, reporting purposes, looking at information to uh, appeal whether or not providers are doing this on a regular basis and should be paid, um, as well as making sure we have accurate information and looking at auditing and making sure coding is done correctly. Hernia repairs are going to be looking at different uh, information regarding the type of hernia and its location. So it's always important to abstract information for the hernias. And bariatric surgeries have a couple of different abbreviations that you'll find on the page 761, giving you both the abbreviation for the bariatric surgery and what it entails. As always, if you find a coding procedure that you're not familiar with, or you don't know the exact approach or the information to code it, make sure you look up the term first and understand all of the information for that type of procedure before continuing. This is especially important when you're coding in this system because a lot of the terminology used is going to be very similar in terms, but very different in procedure. And in fact, you'll notice a lot of the terminology is direct from medical terminology. And there may be some terms that are very close. So make sure you're paying attention to exactly how something is spelled and what you're identifying as the procedure so you don't get the wrong procedure in your coding. Last but not least, when we talk about the GI system, we want to look at what's included in the mouth. I'm going to look now to my code, code book here in digestive or gastrointestinal system. And I'll find here that the lips are one of the first sections that are included. Now, in the gastrointestinal system, you have on page 283, digestive system, for procedures of the skin of the lips, see codes 10040. Let's look at that for just a moment and compare that to what you might be looking at, for example, a biopsy of the lip or a lip shave to identify what exactly is the difference between the skin of the lip and what's included in the GI. I'm going to turn in my code book and I'm going to keep this page marked to code 10040 so we can identify this together. I'll find 10040 on the bottom of page 75, which 10040 is for acne surgery.
So I think that the code book is referencing the wrong section here. And that's okay. To identify the difference between skin and gastrointestinal, you want to identify what part of the lips are being or having a procedure done to. On the lips, approximately two-thirds of the lip is going to be considered the vermilion border. And this is your darker area of the lips itself and part of the GI system. Anything outside of that is going to be considered the skin of the lip and is not part of the GI, but instead part of the skin. That's all I have for you today. For now, make sure you go through all of your coding exercises in your workbook. As you'll notice this week, we don't have any assignments from Connect uh, due to repeating uh, assignments in the chapter. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or for urgent issues requiring a sooner response than two days, make sure to send me a text at 410-9836 identifying your name and the class that you're in. Other than that, we'll see you until next time and have a great day.